And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here. We thank you we have your word. We just pray that as we open it and look at it, uh, and th- uh, consider these things that you would give us understanding. Uh, I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, the reason for this message, the title is the, the Rapture is Real. And I was doing what Ted said he was doing the other night. I was watching YouTube. And my wife says I spend too much time on YouTube. But I find uh, sometimes YouTube is really great. Like if I want to fix something, I go on YouTube and I watch how to do it. And then if I can do it, I do it. Or I look at it and I say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I, it's really nice to be able to you know, have that. So I was looking at YouTube and the thing came up about the rapture. And it was against the rapture. And I watched it. And I wasn't really that impressed by the arguments. This person on the video was a guy named Michael Moret. Anybody ever heard of him? No, probably not. Uh, And he's got a YouTube thing called Scripture Verse by Verse. And he said he was not doing the verse by verse thing that time. He was just doing this against the rapture video. So I watched it. It was I look for videos that are like under ten minutes <laughs> and unless I really wanna see something, then I'll watch a longer one. But uh so I watched it and you know when you watch a YouTube video when you're done, you get a whole bunch of other videos that come up on the side and some of them are related to the ones you watched and some of them are just seemingly to me random things that I don't maybe there's a reason for but I don't know what it is and I was shocked when the video was over I was shocked that the the list the list of the videos on the right hand side of the screen screen were almost all videos against the rapture it wasn't like interspersed it was just and I was kind of like floored by that actually and so I kind of got it in my mind that this was something maybe I should talk about, you know. Uh, this message is not about, although I'll touch on it a little bit, it's not about when is the rapture happening. This message is about is there even a rapture? That's what this message is about because this guy was saying and all the other videos uh, that I watch like this were against the rapture absolutely totally so look at Matthew 24 all of the videos I watched touched on this verse Matthew 24 verse 37 and a few verses following there but as in the days but as the days of Noah were so shall it also be in the coming of the son of man for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And here's the verses that are referred to often. Uh, Then two shall be in the field and one shall be taken (coughs) uh, and the other left and two women shall be grinding at the mill and one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what our your Lord doth come. So that then, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people who are for the rapture, and they use that. That's one of the verses they use. And back in the early days of my Christian life, you know, uh, over 50 years ago now, I was saved in 1971, and uh, there was a book that was out about that time called The Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody read that book? Yeah, that was a very popular book. And he was making a date. And, well, see, that's the whole problem with all of these things. But anyway, I don't believe this is a rapture, just so you're not concerned about me. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, does the Bible teach the rapture? Yeah, yeah it does. And I, I felt kind of concerned that the body of Christ is moving away, maybe it's just my feelings about it, but it's my perception 
is that the body of Christ is moving away from the rapture, and not only the rapture, but also dispensationalism, because those two things are kind of related, aren't they? Of course, the Bible does teach, teach the rapture, so we're going to look at some of these things uh, uh, for a few minutes here. Now, the word rapture, of course, that's not in the Bible, is it? And the word trinity, it's not in there either. So it, it's a word that's used to express something that we believe to be true. We believe the trinity is true, correct, even though that word doesn't appear in the Bible. It is in the Bible, just not in that word. So that's not really an issue. The word, the word rapture is, my son has helped me with this, okay, because he's done the research. The word rapture was first used by a man named Joseph Mead in the 1600s. So there's some people saying that, the, that it was Darby that started the rapture. But the word was used in the 1830s. In the 1600s, somebody was using the word rapture. It wasn't, it wasn't started with Darby. And the word rapture, it's, it's a word that means to be caught up. That's what the word means, like... You listen to music and you're raptured by it. Have you ever, you ever gone to a live version of Handel's Messiah? Yes. I mean, that is like awesome. The Hallelujah Chorus and some of those other, I mean, you just get carried away in that. It's, it's incredible. And, and I, I've seen that three times uh, because somebody was kind enough to, you know, uh, take me pay for my ticket, take me down there, and, and it was a wonderful experience. So the word rapture just means to be caught up. And, and although the word doesn't appear in the Bible, it certainly does express what that is, that concept, that idea. Uh, <coughs> so although the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible and it doesn't really appear in any kind of writings of Christian leaders until, you know, uh, later on, like a couple hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, let's say, uh, <coughs> there were the early believers, I know, you know, you, look, you read the church fathers, a lot of them are whacked out, right? I mean, there's just no way around that, but the, the early believers did believe, so if you're going to look in their writings, you're not looking for the word rapture, are you? But they did believe in the eminent return of Christ, which means that he could come at any time. That's what that means. Uh, there's a fellow named Forrest, Jesse Forrest Silver. He's, he has written a book or had written a book in 1914, is called the Lord's Return, seen in historical and scripture, seen in historical and scripture as premillennial and eminent. So, and you all know, uh, I'm sure that if you uh, turn to Revelation chapter six, that the word thought. No, I'm not asking you to turn there, <laughs> but the word the millennial, 1,000 years is in, I think it's six times in Revelation chapter 6, right? And that's the only time it appears in the Bible. So the problem is that people don't really believe what the Bible says. And they want to like twist it around and turn it around and, and make it say some other things than what it's really saying. So, and that's a problem. The Bible should be understood as literally as you could possibly understand it. Now, having said that, uh, there are symbols, you know, figures of speech, metaphors in there. Usually it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, what they are. And when people talk about, you know, you lose something in translation, usually what you kind of get blurred are those figures of speech. That's usually what gets blurred. But the meanings of the words and stuff, those things don't get changed. So... Well, we're going to look at some verses here. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Does the Bible teach the rapture? And, you know, there aren't a lot of verses about it, but, yes, the Bible does teach the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15. 
And Paul says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, we all know what the word mystery means, don't we? Here, every one of us here probably understands what that is. So, and you know, the problem is, like the fella in the video and all those other people like that, they don't understand the meaning of the word mystery. And see, that's the big problem that they have in their understanding of the scriptures, is they don't get this. Is Let me ask you this. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a mystery is something that was hidden until it was revealed at a certain time. Is And the verse here talks about, uh, we shall not we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment and in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. But let me ask you this. So the verses are talking about a resurrection. Is the resurrection a mystery in the Bible? In the Old Testament, is, are there verses about resurrection? Yeah. So this is something else, Right? Look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. I'll start at, well, I'll just read verse 2 and 3. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. What would that be? The ones who are asleep are dead, right? So they're awaking. That means they're being resurrected, uh, shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You don't want to be in that group. You want to be in the other group. For the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So there's verse, I mean, and the, if, you, if you looked it up, there's lots and lots and lots of verses in the Old Testament scriptures about resurrection. Look at uh, John chapter 11. <clears throat> Here you have Jesus talking to, I think it's Mary. This is John chapter 11, verse... 24, Martha he's talking to, sorry. Their, their brothers died, and they said, you should have been here sooner. Of course, that's not the way it worked out, right? Yeah, he could have fixed that, but he didn't show up because he was going to do something better. So Lazarus is dead, and... Uh, Look at verse 21. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, Martha seems to be the one that's always doing this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, If thou hast been here, my brother had not died, but I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said, said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. So Lazarus is going to rise. Martha, I love this verse this next verse, because it tells me and it shows me that Martha had faith and believed the Old Testament scriptures. She says, Martha said unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha believed that he would rise again. I think that's a wonderful thing. But Jesus has something else in mind, right? But see, I point that verse out to you because here you have this lady in the, during the time of the earthly ministry of Christ, and she had read or heard Daniel chapter 12. She knew about what it said and those other verses, and we're not going to look at all those other verses, but there are quite a few. So, so let me ask you this. Was the resurrection a mystery? Was the resurrection something that was hidden and not revealed? No. That was something that was known. So then I'll turn back to 1 Corinthians 15. He says, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. So there's something about this. 
That's not the same as that. Now, the problem these non-rapture people have is they don't get that word. They don't understand that. And what, what do these non-rapture people do most of the time in their Bible study? What books of the Bible do they study most of the time? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's all they know. And they might pull a verse out of Paul's epistles. Oh, I like this one, and I like this one, and I like this one, and I like this one. And then they do that. But if, I don't know. You know, I'm just a guy, and nobody pays attention to me. But, but I mean, they ought to pay more attention to Paul. Why, why did God need another apostle? He already had 12. We do that fair thing, and one of the questions we ask, we have these quiz boxes, was Paul the 12th apostle? And most people don't even know the names of the 12 apostles, you know. But, I mean, that's not the point of the question. The point of the question is, no, Paul was not one of the 12 apostles. And then sometimes someone will come along and they'll say, you ever heard this one? That uh, they shouldn't have had Matthias, it should have been Paul. How, how in the world would that have ever worked? You know, Paul doesn't really even show up until, you know, chapter 7, right? Isn't it amazing? God's going to save this guy Saul of Tarsus in chapter 9, and he, he suddenly appears at the end of chapter 7. I mean, wow! Obviously, God knew what he was doing. <laughs> so... When he says here, behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. That's something different than what Daniel wrote about and what Martha knew about because there's something... There were some things that had changed, and there were some things that were different. And, and if you don't understand the, 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 the distinctive nature of the body of Christ in comparison to the nation Israel, you're not going to get this stuff. And if that's what you believe to be the case, you're not going to believe in a rapture because that's something that's really like alien to you. So then you'll go on YouTube and you'll start saying, no, there's no rapture, there's no rapture. You know, those guys, if they're really saved, and it's not for me to decide, they're really going to be surprised one day, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> He's just walking down the street, you don't believe in the rapture, and boom! <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe Christ isn't going to take them because they don't believe in it. No, I don't, I don't believe that. I show you a mystery. We shall all be changed in a moment. It's like, bam, in the twinkling of an eye. I kind of had this at the end, but are there any signs that have to happen before that happens? None. And you can't look at the world and what's going on in the world and say, oh, the Lord has to come soon. Because, you know, they were saying that back in the 1830s, Darby, and they've been saying this... If you, ever, if you look on Google and you search for the second return of Christ, second coming of Christ, there's been people saying that that was going to happen since like 300 A.D. And I, I guess Paul kind of believed it would happen in his lifetime. So the rapture is something different than the second coming of Christ because this was something that wasn't revealed. And, and well, look at... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Of course, the two, two most famous verses about this are this verse here, this passage here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. Second Thessalonians chapter 4. And you all know this passage, I'm sure. Uh, Verse 13. 13. Second, I'm sorry. First Thessalonians 4 Thessalonians 4.13. 
But, but I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So what's asleep? Dead. You know, there's been now 2,000 years almost of time where believers in Christ have passed away, have died. And don't, don't you sometimes, I wonder anyway, how many people that is? What a, what a vast number of people that will be. Uh, I, I, I suppose that uh, percentage-wise of the population of the world at any time that the, the number of actual believers in Christ is probably a smaller number, but if you take that number over all the years, you know, that's a lot of people. Uh, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, if you have uh, relatives who were saved, who were saved and have gone on, uh, passed away, gone to be with Christ, uh, this is very comforting to know that you'll see them again, isn't it? My mother died when I was 13. You know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But my mother was a believer, so I know I look forward to the day when I tell people when I get to heaven, I'm going to go, I'm going to go see Jesus Christ first, and then I'm going to go see my mother and father, and then I'm going to go see the Apostle Paul. <laughs> so he's fourth on the list. I hope he doesn't feel like offended, you know. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, for we that we sorrow not as even not as others which have no hope. Death is a is a sorrowful thing. It, it makes you sad. The reason my wife is not here was her brother passed away, you know, a week ago on Monday, and so she had to go down there and take care of that stuff. And it, it's gut wrenching when someone dies unexpectedly especially you know if they're sick for a long time and you know they're kind of going down and then they finally pass well then you know you're kind of ready for that but when somebody dies and you're not expecting it it's like ugh, it, it's shocking it's you know terrible thing but we have a hope we have something not this maybe who it but rock solid confident expectation in a future event for we believe verse 14 for if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so them which also sleep in jesus will god bring with him whoa now here's something that's not revealed in the old testament about this resurrection that's going to take place christ is going to bring those people with him for I say unto you, by the word of God, that we which are alive and remain shall not uh, uh, remain unto the coming of the Lord. That, <laughs> I'm hoping I'm alive on that day. You know, I, I said I was saved in 71. When I got saved, I didn't have quite the understanding I have now of things. And I was expecting to be alive. I was expecting to make it to the rapture. Now I'm not so sure. I mean, it could still work, but I'm not so sure. And I'm okay with that, you know, if that's what happens. But I'd rather go that way, personally. Uh, uh, which remain under the coming of the Lord Jesus shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then... We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. So you see pictures of people being caught up. And you know, and I like those pictures. <laughs> I say, yeah, that's right. I look forward to that if I happen to make it. <clears throat> so I don't know, the people that don't believe in the rapture, they obviously think that these verses have something to do with the second coming of Christ. That's really the only way that this will work. But uh, let me back up a second here and say this, that the, the anti-rapture people, and almost every one of them, said 
and th that this was kind of symbolic of when a when a important person would come to a city to visit a city like let's say the king or somebody as as he was coming toward the city the people of the city would go out to meet him and that's what's happening Christ is coming back and then we're going to meet him and come back with him but you know that's a little it seems to me that that's a little different the the king is coming to the city and the people go out to meet him is a little little different than the king coming to the city and him reaching in there you know pulling them out so that's to me just a lame excuse to get away from you know what this is here for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first so he brings them back and then their bodies are resurrected to meet their spirits their souls and then we are caught up and changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye uh caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's a tremendous comfort, really, isn't it? I mean, that's really <laughs> to know that this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, as a believer in Christ, you don't need to be afraid of death. Death is not, death is an enemy, you know, but it's not your enemy. Now, I want to, I want you to turn to Revelation 19 because this is the passage where the second coming of Christ is. So, and then we're going to maybe flip back and forth a little bit here. But <clears throat> Revelation 19:11. You know, the book of Revelation, it's a hard book, isn't it? And, and there's questions about exactly what all of the things mean or the way it works. Is it... Is it the, you know, the, the things, is it this and this and this, or is it then, does it like repeat with the trumpets and the scrolls and the seals, you know, is that a repetition of the same thing or is it a progression? And, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure myself, but I know this. Somebody asked me one time, where are we in the book of Revelation? <laughs> and there, you could go down through history and people say we're in chapter 15, chapter 13, something like that. That's a bunch of silly nonsense. We have nothing to do with the book of Revelation. We will be gone when those things happen. But anyway, the return of Christ is something that's been known for a long time, right? Verse uh, Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. Who is this? Jesus Christ, right? And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. I want you to think about this, and then you think about the passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, and you compare them. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that he himself knew, that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Isn't that interesting? The Word of God. It's a sharp, two-edged sword, right? That with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. Is the second coming of Christ, it's kind of a bloody event, isn't it? Yeah. So one of the videos I watched, I, I just, I couldn't wrap my mind around what this lady was saying. That we learn in the Gospels that this isn't going to be the way it is. You know, when Christ comes back, he's going to annihilate his enemies. I wouldn't want to be the enemy of Christ on that day. <laughs> he talks about treading the wine press of the wrath of God. You know what's in the wine press? 
not grapes. People. When Christ comes back and he sets up his kingdom initially, there will be no one on earth who is opposed to him. Everyone there will be on his side and for him. But you know, there's some people that go into the millennial kingdom in physical bodies and they still have free wills. And maybe they're just following along because it's the thing to do. And that's why Satan's bound and then released at the end of the thousand years is to sort all that stuff out. It's not all lovey-dovey, feel-good stuff, necessarily. So now, think about this. He's, I have a list here. He comes on a white horse. There's a sword coming out of his mouth. He comes to make war. The armies of heaven are with him. This is the second coming of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, The Lord himself descends with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ are resurrected and then caught, we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Does that sound like the same thing to you? Not in my book, it's not the same thing. And <clears throat> the thing these people don't get is about the mystery and about Paul's apostleship and about the body of Christ being separate from the nation Israel. Are there verses that say those things? Hmm, let me think. Yes! <laughs> now turn back to the Matthew 24 passage. Matthew 24 passage, this is what's called the Olivet Discourse. And the disciples, they're up on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And the disciples asked, this is kind of, look at chapter 24, uh, verse 3. And, the, and he said, upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when these things shall be, and what shall be the signs of thy coming. I, they must have understood something. You know, the, the, the ascension back to heaven is part of the prophetic program, right? Psalm 110, verse 1. That, wasn't, that didn't happen because people rejected Christ and God was going to start the body of Christ in the age of grace. That's not why that happened. He, it was prophesied he was going to go back to heaven after his ministry, although maybe in the Old Testament, if he didn't have the insight of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, maybe it'd be hard to see that. But, you know, Peter talks in First Peter, the key to understanding the prophetic program was there was a coming to suffer and a coming for glory. And in between those two things, he was going back to heaven. That was in the prophetic program. So they ask, what's going to be the signs of thy coming? So now he gives them this, this discourse, the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse covers essentially the same things as the book of Revelation covers. It's the same time period mostly. There's more, obviously, information in Revelation. And, of course, Revelation hadn't been written at this point of time yet. So anyway, verse 37, Matthew 24, 37, but... But as the days of Noah were, <coughs> so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah, uh, as in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And he knew, and they knew not, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Then, then two shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left, and two women shall be grinding at the mill, and the other one be taken, uh, one taken, and the other left. So uh, there's something there. You know, there's two people, then one person's taken away. So 
if you don't understand mid-Acts dispensationalism, you might think that is the rapture. Because it kind of sounds like, you know, this catching away. Uh, but this not. This is part of the prophetic program. And this passage was cited by practically every one of these people in these videos I watched because the people who believe the rapture, the Acts 2 people who think that this is the rapture, that, see, that's the problem. It's not Acts 2. It's not Acts 2. And I guess all of you probably pretty much understand that, but a lot of people don't. The body of Christ did not start in Acts 2. It couldn't have started in Acts 2. This is the second coming of Christ. And this can't be the rapture. Why is it this can't be the rapture? Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. The rapture, when Christ speaks these words, was hidden, not revealed. Just as the body of Christ was hidden, and not revealed. And just as Romans to Philemon were hidden and not revealed, Christ in his earthly ministry was not talking about the body of Christ. Wow, what a thought. You, once you get your mind wrapped around that, pretty much the whole Bible just opens right up to you. Christ comes back the second time at his return, and there's a route that he takes. You can trace that in the Old Testament. And then ultimately he ends up on the Mount of Olives. And then the Mount of Olives is split in half. All those things are in the Old Testament. The ones that are taken here in this passage in Matthew 24, it's as the days of Noah. Who, who was taken away in the days of Noah? The good people or the bad people? The bad people, right? So this is not the rapture. I don't believe I've ever heard anybody in this group, any teacher, I, I don't recall ever hearing anybody say or teach that this is the rapture in this group of people. I don't believe that I've ever, I've ever heard that. And that's good because this isn't the rapture. <laughs> so let me turn up. Look at my notes here. I was sitting up in the room looking at these notes before I came down, and I thought, man, i got to change this around. <laughs> so i got to go back to where I was before. Uh, there are other passages about the rapture, right? That's not explained like these, but there are, uh, are other ones. Uh, look at Matthew 3, 7. And this, you're in Matthew, I think. And... This isn't the rapture, okay, just so you don't get worried. Here you have John the Baptist preaching, and the Pharisees and the leaders come down to see what he's doing. Uh, Matthew 3, 7, let's start at 6, and we're baptized of him uh, in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Here's my opinion. John didn't immerse anybody. He did not immerse. You know why I know that? Because in Ezekiel 36, it talks about God sprinkling them with clean water. So what did John do? He would get them down into the water, and then he would, maybe he had a hyssop branch or something, he would flip water onto them. Verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, so these people come down, the leaders come down, and, and he said unto them, this is not the way to you know, win your audience over. Oh, generation of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes. It's kind of like when, when Jesus called that Syrophoenician woman a dog. And it's like, oh, people, people say Jesus was a racist and, and a, you know, all these kind of things. Why do they say that? Because they, they don't have any dispensational understanding of the scriptures. So he says here, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? The wrath to come is a specific thing. 
The wrath to come is Matthew 24. The wrath to come is the book of Revelation. It is a prophesied thing. And these people, the people coming down to be baptized of John, not the Pharisees, they were being baptized in preparation for the end of the nation Israel in the final days of Israel. But the Pharisees, they, you know, they're all mighty, holy, high-minded. They think they're great and wonderful. And you think about the Pharisee and the publican, you know, and the Pharisee looks at the publican and he says, you know, thank you, God, I'm not like that guy. What a disgusting thing to say. So the wrath to come is a specific thing. Now, let's see. Second Thessalonians. Is this the one I want? I think it is. No, it's First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Sorry. First Thessalonians 1, verse 10. <clears throat> the church at Thessalonica, they were having trouble. Remember, Paul went into Thessalonica and they ran him out of town? It was there like three weeks, two, three weeks, and they ran him out of town. And then he moved to Berea, the name Berean, Berea, right? That's a great name for a great church. <laughs> These were more... These, I can't quote the verse, they, you know, they were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures, and that's the idea, obviously. They hated Paul so much that when they heard he went to Berea, that they went there, there, to cause him trouble. So, I mean, these, those people were just, you know, insane. So the Thessalonians were having trouble because of the persecutions and whatnot. But Paul says in the first epistle, chapter 1, verse 10, uh, we'll start at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which which delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come is the tribulation. That phrase means that he has delivered us. We have been delivered from having to go through that time, the time of tribulation, the time of, of God's wrath. You know, God's going to be right to pour out his wrath on this planet, is he not? Amen. And I'm, I'm a pretty mild-mannered guy mostly, but I'll be so happy when God does that. <laughs> I'll be, yes! So, the rapture comes before the tribulation to deliver us from the wrath. We are not going to be the subject of the wrath of God. You're in Christ. God's wrath isn't going to fall on you. Is another verse, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So the second letter to the Thessalonians, in the second chapter, he actually, Paul actually describes some of the things in the tribulation period. My understanding is that the Thessalonians might have thought that they were in the tribulation. The persecution was bad, and they might have thought that they were suffering because that's where they were. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that ye not be, that ye not be soon shaken in mind or troubled by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. So he's writing them to tell them, listen, you're not in that. And then he describes in chapter 2 some of the things that are happening that are going to happen in that time period. So how is it that we're not going through that period? Because we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air before that happens. Now, 
I look forward to that, as I said, and I hoped I would make it, but I still might, but I'm not, like, maybe I was, like, counting on it at one time when I was a new believer, you know, yeah, I'm going to make it, but, you know, that didn't work out <laughs> that way. <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie or read the books, The Left Behind? Well, they're entertaining, you know. I, 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 there's several of the Left Behind movies. I don't know if I've seen them all, but I've seen some of them, and I'm, I'm watching. And I'm, they, they, they in the movie they, kind of put forward the idea, I guess, because they just don't know any better, that whatever gospel is being preached now is going to be preached then. You know, that's not right. There's another gospel different gospel to be preached in the tribulation period. We, one of the questions that are quiz boxes, are there more than one, is there more than one gospel in the Bible? You all know the answer to that, right? Yeah, of course there is. And you can show, I mean, it's easy to prove it if you want to. So some, this guy came and he was kind of giving us a hard time about that, you know. And... Uh, he stood and talked for a long time, almost, and it was almost an argument. <laughs> when you're at the fair, you want to be careful not to get in a fight with anybody because <laughs> the fair's not going to let you come back. <laughs> so, he, he, so he was kind of getting, he was talking to one fella, and then you know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe you should step back from this because it was getting a little bit intense. But I asked this guy, well, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the gospel being the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And he says, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, can you go back into the gospels and Christ sends his disciples out to preach and they're going out and preaching. And that's chapter 10 of Matthew. And I think it's Matthew 16. It says, he starts to tell them about his death, burial, and resurrection. And what does Peter say to Christ when Christ starts telling Peter about that? Does Peter say, oh, praise God? He rebukes the Lord and says, be it far from you, Lord. So I said to the guy, so if this is the gospel over here and Peter doesn't know that because it says that they didn't know it, what were they doing before that? And that guy, he didn't really have an answer for that. And the really funny thing was, I don't, really, I don't know if this means anything, he came back, he left for a while, then he came back, and then before, he was sitting in the booth laughing with us. And I thought, <laughs> so I don't know if he embraced this idea or not, but I mean, I thought it was really strange that that's what he did. But... There's a different gospel in tribulation period. It's not the gospel of grace. It's a different gospel. So in the Left Behind series, I would say, if you haven't watched it, don't bother. <laughs> you know, and the, the real problem with the rapture seems to me is all of the date setting and people have been setting dates I told you I got saved in 71 and it was that book by Hale Lindsey and, and yeah, I think it's May 14th 1948 Israel was reborn as a nation and that that is a pretty phenomenal thing is that is that current nation is that the fulfillment of the regathering of Israel in the Bible I don't know because there's a, in Matthew 9 there, where in the middle of the 70 weeks in a gap, it talks about the, the, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city of Jerusalem. And people say that that was what happened in 70 AD with the Romans. I don't think it, that was it. I think there's probably, because my understanding is that the Antichrist is going to be from Assyria. And the Assyrians aren't the ones that destroy Jerusalem. 
So if the Romans' destruction of Jerusalem, that were the fulfillment of that, then that would mean the Antichrist would have to be from Rome. And I know the Pope's not the Antichrist, okay? So there still could be a future destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And then I could see the Antichrist coming up. You know, there's that, that mosque right where the temple was. And if they went in there and tried to do anything to that, you know, wow, that would be like, what if there was a war and that was destroyed? And then the Antichrist allows him to build a temple there. Is there going to be a temple in the millennia, in the, the tribulation period? Yeah. So, I mean, and the problem with things in the future is that in the future, <laughs> and you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, do you? Don't you really? Really, you should be glad you don't know rather than trying to go find out because none of those people are going to do you any good. So the date setting, that I think, you know, there's been so many dates set for the return of Christ or the rapture. The dates and dates, Hal Lindsey said, had to be 1988, a generation, 40 years, a generation from 1948. And you know, 1988, you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> and then there was 89 reasons why Christ has to come in 1989. You know, and then there's just been countless, countless, countless hundreds, maybe thousands of people who have said that Christ is returning a certain time. And you know what? We're all still here. Harold Camping 